Oh, I get it. I'm always the evil character. I'm always the evil one. Or I'm so funny. <laughs> I'm your fat, funny friend. <laughs> okay, this is where it started. This is where it began for me. Middle school community theater. <laughs> When I didn't get cast as Dorothy, this was a turning point in my life. Dude, where are you? Pick up your phone. Um, there's a song party tonight, and you're obviously invited, so call me back. Okay, love you. Bye. What's up, you guys, and welcome back to Emotionally Online, the weekly slumber party for spilling guts and sharing secrets, hosted by yours truly. The one and only Maddie Drawsbeck coming at you for a little mini episode. We've got a little tiny baby episode this week. A little tiny infant baby. Because I'm about to hop on a plane to go visit my family for Thanksgiving. Literally, I have to leave for the airport in like uh, less than an hour. <laughs> I'm like, I'm really pushing it by even sitting down and committing to doing this for as long as I end up rambling for, um, because I do still need to finish packing and, you know, we just, we're limited on time here. It's the holidays. So I want to make sure I get to the airport a reasonable amount of time in advance. So I don't end up stranded at the airport. Cause that would suck. That would suck cheek for real because I need to get my ass to Maine so that I can hunker down with my sister and play fucking Toontown for a week. I just need to do that for my mental health. I need to get my ass into town. This past week, I literally sat right here on my couch and I played the new Mario Party for hours and I played Toontown and it was fucking awesome and it fucking rocks and I I pity the people that every time I say something about Toontown or I post about it on my Instagram, sorry, there's someone that's like, this still exists? Where? I'm like... You're so behind, bro. Like, you're a decade behind because Toontown Rewritten has existed for 10 years. Over 10 years at this point. I think this past summer, maybe, was the 10-year anniversary of Toontown Rewritten. And um, my sister and I have been playing on the same accounts for the past 10 years. So, anyways, I'm really good at the game and I just need to sit down with my sister and play fucking Toontown. This time of year is the tooniest time of year. I've been saying this. And it's because when we were younger... My parents were like so anti Toontown because we we literally can sit there and play it all fucking day and not do anything else. And when we were kids, they were so annoyed by that. They were like, go outside. What are you guys doing? Just rotting your brains, staring at the screen all day. And um, back in the day, Toontown was something you had to pay for when it was owned by Disney. And you would pay like a monthly subscription to play Toontown they would sell the little cards at like the grocery store checkout aisles and my parents refused to buy us the Toontown cards during any other time of year other than the holidays Christmas vacation specifically they'd give it to us as like an early Christmas present so that we could enjoy it for the time off that we had and we would literally do fucking nothing else Um, because it's just the best game ever And they literally, there is so much to do in that game. The fact that I've been playing on the same account for the last 10 years and I still haven't beat the game yet because they keep adding more and making it harder. And it's like, it's just such a grind. Anyways, Toontown heads know what's up. And if you're not a Toontown head, I really, I feel so sorry for you because that game fucks. That game fucks. Okay. I also love that it's like a chat game and you can talk to people (laughs) while you're playing with them. And so... I don't know. I have fun fucking with people on Toontown. Like when me and my sister and our friend Marissa link up, the three of us, when we get on Toontown and start fucking with people, that's like the most fun I have all year is bullying people on Toontown. <laughs> like I'm at home fucking giggling and cackling. Okay. I don't laugh harder. That is the thing that brings me the most joy in this life. Bullying on Toontown. <laughs> I think when I'm home, I'm going to have to convince my siblings to go see Wicked with me a second time. I saw Wicked last week, opening night. I was so excited. I'm a theater kid. We know this. And if you didn't know this, how did you not know this? Not, I just shouldn't even need to have told you that. You should just know by looking at me and innately that I am a theater kid. And um, I, I, Wicked is not necessarily one of my like favorite shows. It's not one that has like a real deep uh impact on me but I do love the music from Wicked and it reminds me of theater camp Mango always loves to do this just climb on me and then she looks around like she's so confused this isn't a comfortable place to sit now she's gonna lick me but it's like Mango (laughs) I love you
I love you and your little quirks. It's my favorite thing. <laughs> um, but it really reminds me of theater camp because we sang so many of the Wicked songs at camp. Um, and my sister and I, we did a duet the last summer that I ever went to camp to One Short Day. Um, I was Alpha Bud and she was Glinda. <laughs> So though I'm not like Wicked's number one fan, I do love Wicked. I'm just not like a Wicked diehard. I'm just setting your expectations here for me. <laughs> I've only ever seen Wicked on Broadway once, but I do love the music and I do love the story. It's a great show. I was very excited for it. Um, so I went opening night with my friends Kayla and Steven and oh my God. Oh my God. Like, I don't know. I don't know what I thought was going to happen or what I thought my experience with this movie was going to be. But uh, to be honest, I didn't expect to be that moved. I was so moved. I mean, I was open mouth sobbing. I think that's maybe the hardest I've cried in a movie all year. And I cried pretty hard at Dee Dee. But I, I pulled it together by the end. Like the credits ran and I continued to cry and then I like sucked it back in. No, I could not suck it back in after Wicked. After Wicked, I was like, I mean, open mouth sobbing, hard to contain myself during Defying Gravity. And then the credits roll and I'm just like, oh my God, oh my God. And I look at my friend and I just like, start crying even more and I like I, I I like sniffled and made one of those like gross noises because I was like I low-key wasn't getting enough oxygen <laughs> and it's just like you know when you ugh, I'm embarrassed just thinking about it but I was really truly so moved Ariana Grande is also fantastic but I just thought that Cynthia stole the show stole the show and um yeah, her her delivery of Defying Gravity just moved the shit out of me. I also cried during One Short Day, which is not a sad song, obviously. Um, but it's the one I sang with my sister. So I was just thinking about her the whole time. They're like, two best friends. Do, 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 do. Sharing one wonderful one shot. The wizard will see you now. Day. <laughs> I was just thinking about Morgan the whole time. And so I cried during One Short Day. And then sobbing, sobbing, sobbing during Defying Gravity. Inconsolable cried in the uber home sat here on my couch and was like you know i need to listen to for good right now um which obviously for good's not gonna be in this movie it's in the next one part two which i just am convinced that i need to watch by myself at like a middle of the day tuesday 2 p.m showing <laughs> because i'm gonna be audibly crying during for good for good is my favorite song from wicked and um yeah i got home and I was still in my crying era, post Wicked, sat on this couch and listened to For Good and just continued to cry. And, and I just think I need to go see it again and cry more. I don't think I'm done. I don't think I've cried enough, actually. I think I need to go do it again. I need to go bring my siblings and be like, are you guys ready to cry? <laughs> this is what I did with them last Thanksgiving break. I had just seen Saltburn. I went home and I was like, are you ready to live? Are you ready to eat, sleep and breathe for Barry Keoghan? All right, are you ready? Let's go. And I sat with them in the theater and then afterwards I'm like, five stars, right? Holding them at gunpoint. I'm like, five stars, right? You think? Five stars, perfect movie? And they were like, yes, Maddie. <laughs> and I'm about to do the same thing with Wicked. Even though I gave it a four and a half stars immediately afterwards, but I could be swayed to give it five. I know why I initially docked the point five, and it was because there were aspects of it that weren't like perfect to me. And also I definitely think they could have shaved off a little bit in the middle there. Um, but the more I sit with it, the more I love it. And the more I'm like on second watch, I think you could convince me to give this a five. It, I mean, it's a near perfect movie in my opinion. And I just fucking, I love it. I do. I love it. I'm a wicked head. What can I say? <laughs> How can you not listen to Defying Gravity and cry? I just feel like if you don't cry during Defying Gravity, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> That's my opinion, because how can you not hear those lyrics, that delivery, the like magic in her voice to see the courage to step out of line and to be like, no, I need to do this for me. This is what I need to do for myself and for other people. And I'm going to go against what all these people want me to be, how they want me to act, and I'm going to do what I think is right. The courage to do what you think is right. 
how can you not cry? How can you not cry? It just like, I start thinking about it and I just lose it. I just fucking lose it. And if I'm flying solo, at least I'm flying free, babe. I need to trust my instincts, close my eyes and leave. I think I'll try defying gravity. <laughs> like, how can you not just feel it in your bones and be like, God, yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Especially with, like, the timing of Wicked coming out post-election. Like, how can you not feel that in seeing the, like, corruption within the Wicked universe and the parallels to our own and what it means to like be courageous and speak up about the things that you think are important and the people that you think are being forgotten. Oh, also it's a story about friendship and how it changes us for the better. Oh my God. Like, sorry, sorry. How can I not cry? (laughs) It's just, it's quite something. It's quite something how everything just sort of comes back around, you know? Anyways, magic absolutely phenomenal if you are at home thinking to yourself I'm not gonna go see wicked musicals aren't really my thing I don't know if I'm gonna love this I say push it to the wind you need to go see that fucking movie it is so good and yeah I'm a theater person I love musicals but I think that this is just so fantastic I think Cynthia and Ariana are so good that even if you're not a musical person, I think you'll be able to recognize how like truly spectacular this is. And this just makes me more excited for the Oscars because I'm like, I feel like I never in all of like the predictions lists because I keep up to date on all of like the Oscars predictions and um, you know what the sources are reporting, what the numbers are looking like and I feel like on a lot of the lists, Wicked has not been a big player, but suddenly over the last week, all of these lists are being updated and Wicked's being added. Like, okay, no, best picture, Wicked, huge contender. I don't know. Like thinking about who I think is going to win, I don't think Wicked would win best picture. I could see it being nominated though. Watch me eat my words. I feel like Anora is going to win Best Picture. That's what I feel. That's my prediction is that Anora is both going to be nominated for Best Picture and it's going to win. Um, and then what are the other ones that people are saying? Like Sing Sing, Conclave, Wicked, Anora, um, Dune 2, Gladiator 2, which I've heard mixed reviews on. I heard it was kind of cheeky. Um, Blitz, which I also heard was Cheeks. Um, and then what are the final three that I've been hearing people talk about a lot? Maybe a different man. I've seen that kind of a different man, a real pain and like, um, uh, what is it? The nickel boys. I haven't seen that yet. I don't think it's come out near me yet, but it should be about to, I think those are the names that I've heard the most thrown around for best picture. And of those, I could see a Nora winning. Anora is my number four of the year. So I loved Anora. That's a five-star movie for me. I would be happy if Anora won. But anyways, interesting point there just being that I've seen Wicked get thrown into the conversation for um, the Oscars more and more after uh, opening weekend. And I'm loving it. I'm loving that attention. I think everyone should go see it. It was absolutely fucking phenomenal. But also it is so funny to me seeing the people that are not theater kids um that are now watching wicked for the first time and engaging with the soundtrack for the first time being like oh my god popular is so fun i love popular and i'm like you watch it you watch yourself (laughs) because i feel like theater kids ran popular to the fucking ground babe like every theater kid i know that has ever auditioned for anything has used popular as their fucking audition song at least once. I don't know a damn theater kid that has never used popular as an audition song. Like when you were in middle school, I'm not talking adulthood. Um, I think in middle school, there was like every seventh grader was like, I need to use popular as my audition song. And everyone thinks they're like really reinventing the wheel with how they deliver it when actually they're not. They're just like cosplaying as Kristen Chenoweth. <laughs> Like, they're not doing a damn thing different. But every seventh grader is like, you've never seen popular like my popular, babe. (laughs) Like, myself included. I'm delivering this read because I was a part of that group, okay? I I auditioned for The Wizard of Oz 
using popular. And this was a really meaningful, important audition for me because I, this was the first show that I was not auditioning for the evil role in all of the shows that I had done before I had auditioned for the evil role or like the more theatrical role I was never like the sweetie protagonist uh female character and when I went to audition for the Wizard of Oz I was in like seventh grade I was like 13 not seventh grade eighth grade maybe I don't know I was baby it was in middle school um when I went to go audition for The Wizard of Oz, I was like, I'm going to go for Dorothy because I just wanted to be cast as something cutie and sweet. And I wanted to be like something different. I didn't want to be typecast as the um, more over the top character. In previous shows, I had played Cruella DeVille. I was cast as Sharpay Evans. Um, and then maybe most recently to Wizard of Oz, I had played the genie in Aladdin, which is obviously not the evil character, but the genie is the best fucking character in Aladdin, let's be fucking honest. And um, anyways, I was just always the most theatrical over the top character, but I was like, I want to go outside of the box here. I want to really push the boundaries of who I am as an actor and um, go for Dorothy. So to make a long story short, I did not get cast as Dorothy. <laughs> And that was a lesson to me to always stick within the box they put you in. I'm kidding. <laughs> I didn't get Dorothy. I'm pretty sure I was like the narrator or something in Wizard of Oz. It was some background character that didn't even have a fucking name. Whatever it was. Maybe it was a munchkin. I don't know. I don't remember. <laughs> I just remember that I was pissed. I was like, are you fucking for real? <laughs> I sang popular and I fucking did that shit to death. Okay. Y'all never seen popular the way that I did popular. Didn't get cast as Dorothy. Are you fucking kidding me? You couldn't have even cast me as Glinda. Could I not have been Glinda? Fuck this. Fuck everyone. Fuck all of you. You don't know talent when you see it. I could have been fucking Dorothy. <laughs> I could have been fucking Dorothy. I could have been the main bitch. Okay. <laughs> Oh, I get it. I'm always the evil character. I'm always the evil one. Or I'm so funny. Ah, ha, ha. I'm your fat funny friend. Ah. Okay, this is where it started. This is where it began for me. Middle school community theater. <laughs> when I didn't get cast as Dorothy, this was a turning point in my life. What the hell? I can be the main female character, okay? I could. <laughs> Everyone could look at me and be like, oh my God, she's Dorothy. I could be a believable Dorothy. Someone cast me as Dorothy. It's not too fucking late. I wish that in New York there was more of like a community theater scene, but there's really not because of the like larger theater scene that exists in New York and all the rules for like, I don't know, unions and who's allowed to act where and why and what it's for. And anyways, sometimes I'm like, that would be awesome to live in like the middle of nowhere. <laughs> This is the only thing that I'm like, maybe I would like the suburbs. Maybe I would love to live just in bumfuck. The only thing that makes me think that all of that would be fun is community theater and being able to like be cast as Dorothy in my adulthood and put on like a production of Wizard of the Oz where like grown adults are playing munchkins. That would be awesome. I would have a lot of fun with that. I would love to act. Oh, it would be so awesome. But it's like, ah, oh, this is the same problem I had with dance for all those years. Where, like, for years I wanted to find a dance studio in New York that was just for funsies, for adults. And it was just impossible to find one. Um, it was either, like, I don't know, a hardo fitness dance class or you're just, like, a professional dancer. There was no, like, I don't know like recreational dance classes where it's the same people every single week and you're just there to have a good time. Maybe you do a little dance recital. And until I found Good Move, there was nothing even remotely like that vibe. And then I found Good Move and everything is right in the world and God bless Good Move for existing and filling my need for that. But now I feel the same way about theater. Like I miss community theater. I miss being able to have that as a hobby, but it feels like in New York, it just doesn't exist as a hobby Unless you're doing like improv, which I don't want to do improv. Give me a script, babe. <laughs> you know, but I feel like acting as a hobby 
not as like a paid career. I don't know that it really exists much here, which I feel like it should exist, but I don't, I don't know if it does. I was trying to read about this and I, it was something about the restrictions because of all of the like paid commercial theater work that happens here. It just is not much of a thing, but I wish that it was because I do love acting and I love singing and I love musicals and I could be a damn good Dorothy. Or you know what? Let's run it back. Let's do High School Musical Junior again. <laughs> and I'll be Sharpay as an adult. And I would eat down, okay? Let's not second guess here. I could fuck up. Bop, 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 bop to the top. Slip and slide and ride that rhythm. I could eat it. I could be so good. Ending of Act 1, stick to the status quo. Food all over Sharpay, screaming at the top of my lungs. Like, that would be so cathartic. I would enjoy that so much more now than I ever did then. I didn't know how good I had it. So often I have these reflections just thinking about my child self, and I was like, God, everything was fun. Everything was so awesome and fun then, and I had no idea how awesome and fun it really was. I think in my head I was like, well, it's going to be awesome and fun when I'm an adult too because I'm awesome and fun. And I'm just going to bring that energy with me everywhere. And I'll do community theater when I'm older. And then I get older and it's like, well, actually, there is no opportunity for that. Huh? What the heck? How come adults are not fun? (laughs) How come you guys are fucking boring? Anyways, (laughs) go watch Wicked. (laughs) So in the comment section of last week's episode, somebody suggested that we take my like people's Oscars idea and we do a version of that on the podcast, which I love. And I kind of want it to encompass more than just movies, like an end of year lover girls awards where you guys can chime in and we'll have a little end of year award ceremony of our own. So the reason I'm presenting this to you now is because I'd love to know what categories you would like to see at the 2024 Lover Girls Awards. Any ideas you have up in your head based on your experience as a listener of this show, what categories would be the most interesting and compelling to you, let me know. Um, I will probably, I'm going to compile my ideas with your ideas, make like a nominations form where you guys can nominate whoever would be worthy of a nomination in that category for the category, I will go through and pick like the five most nominated options from each category. And then we'll send out like official ballots where you guys can vote. And the last episode of the year, we'll do a little award ceremony and I'll try to get some of my friends um, who have been guests over the course of this year involved. How fun would that be? So loving that lover girls awards happening locked in would love to just hear Um, what you guys would like to see at the Lover Girls Awards. Hit me with any idea you have. No idea is too small or too big, okay? Anything you want to suggest, I'm open ears. So feel free to comment on this episode on YouTube, on Spotify, or if you'd prefer something a little bit more private, you can throw it into the submission box um, or DM me on Instagram. I might see it. Instagram is probably the worst way to try to contact me. Um... (laughs) Just throw it out there wherever you'd like to throw your idea into the ring. I welcome it. I welcome it. I encourage it and I need it. So please send me your suggestions. (laughs) All right. Let's do a few audience submissions before I have to go to the airport. I find it super hard to know what I should tolerate in a friendship. Like what is me being neglected and what is me being too sensitive? For example, I have a friend where sometimes I'll be saying something in a voice memo via text that's personal and I just get two sentences as an answer and it makes me feel sad because when they come through with a three minute voice memo telling me something that happened to them, I always engage and ask questions and even offer to hop on a call to talk about it if they want. But I feel silly being like, hey, why don't you ask me questions about the thing I just told you about? And it also feels silly to distance myself from them because technically they didn't do anything wrong. I don't know, things like that where the person didn't do anything that's a red flag, but it still upsets me. What do you think? So I'm going to challenge your perspective a little bit here because it seems like 
your perspective on how to tackle this it sits at like two kind of extremes where it's like you either have like a confrontation with them or you ice them out entirely. And neither of those options feels right inside of your body. And so you sort of feel frozen in the middle. But I think the reality is that those two options are not your only options for how to deal with something like this. And I don't know if maybe you have a history of being within friendships or perhaps familiar relationships where you were not able to deliver um, criticism or speaking about how someone made you feel without being yelled at or it taken to like the highest level of confrontation. But I really think that like this is something minor, right? And if your friend is a good friend, which I'll give them the benefit of the doubt here and assume that they are, if your friend is a great friend, then they should be welcoming Uh, any feedback that you might have for them that would make them a better friend, you know? And I think a lot of times situations like this just act as doors to actually bring us closer to the people that we love. For example, you guys know Ashley, my best friend in the whole world. Um, She and I had a small conflict in high school which to be honest with you I can hardly even remember the details of (laughs) at this point but the heart of the conflict from what I can remember is that we were missing each other Ashley was in a new relationship at the time and we just weren't connecting we didn't have like as much time spent with each other as we did before and we had a conversation about like our our friendship to each other our priority to each other and that was really a conversation that solidified Ashley and I as best friends and I wish I remembered more of this conversation I really do if Ashley was here I'm sure she could jog my memory and I think that's an example of something that's a more minor conflict because what you're the criticism you're delivering is actually not it's not mean it's not like hard for them to hear your criticism is basically just like hey I want you to be more engaged in what I'm saying because I really value your perspective and your friendship. And I just like, I wish that you engage deeper in what I'm saying because I really love you and I want you in my life in a meaningful way. I want you engaged in my personal life in a meaningful way. And it, it makes me upset when we don't get to have that deeper connection or when the stuff that I'm going through isn't really like indulged to a deeper degree, right? You're delivering the criticism because you love them and you value their perspective and you feel that it's lacking and you just wish that they were showing up more. And I think that is like an invitation in. That's an invitation to more intimacy. You're not like drawing a line and being like, and this sucks and you're the worst and now you're kicked out of my life. You're inviting them inwards to be open and vulnerable in response to what you're about to say to them and to also move forward with a greater sense of intimacy within the friendship because you've just made clear to them the level of priority they are to you. And I think that that's why it reminds me of the conversation I had with Ashley, because this was a conversation where I really made clear to Ashley the level of priority she was to me in my life and how I really loved her and I loved our friendship. And I just wanted to make sure it always remained a top priority. And honestly, I think sometimes people don't realize how engaged we want them to be until we say it. And I think we want to hope that everybody has like the friendship intuition to know when they're being called in or know when someone is like, oh, I'm telling you this because I want to hear your perspective and your response. But I think sometimes people genuinely might feel like they don't want to overstep or like impose too much of their reaction or their beliefs on someone else when they're sharing until they are like directly called in in that way. Now, obviously your friend might just be, you know, distracted and not putting in the proper effort that they otherwise would. And that is a totally fair call out in general, but I'm just saying there are other options as well. Um, And in general, I think that calling your friend in, in this way, saying how you feel and letting them react to it, I think that is a really loving thing to do. And it's something that really prioritizes the future of your friendship and the intimacy that you do share now and will share in the future. I think it's a really kind thing to do, actually. And I think that sometimes we 
think about all of this conflict as being like so stressful and like a weight and you're nervous to deliver that criticism um, even though it's minor and it comes from like a place of really loving them. But I think a lot of us do struggle with delivering conflict, myself included, um, because of previous experiences or just, um, yeah, processing, uh, times in your life where maybe you have delivered criticism and it hasn't been received well. Um, that is something that I had to work through in my life as well, having grown up, experiencing situations where I delivered criticism, tried to speak up for myself, speak my feelings, and it wasn't received well. And I mean, even still now, I I am someone that like really dreads conflict of any kind. And I do find myself avoiding uh, speaking up for myself sometimes. And it is something that I actively am aware of and try to work on. Um, particularly in these smaller situations where I think the reframe is helpful for me, where it's like, this actually isn't mean what I'm telling them. Um, it's me saying that I value them so much. I love them as a friend so much. I value their perspective and I want that intimacy with them. It's me expressing to them how important they are and just letting them know that I want them to be more present in the friendship because I love them so much. And I think when I reframe it that way and it feels less like a, Oh, I'm calling you a bad friend or, um, I don't know, saying something that's harder to sit with. When I reframe it in that way, it helps make it feel a little bit easier for me to deliver it. Um, As someone who definitely does struggle with um, conflict and speaking up for myself when I am upset, sharing these more like difficult emotions. Um, It is challenging for me as well, but I do think that it is good and purposeful and a lot of times does serve to like enhance the intimacy of your friendship which is what you want so I think it takes a little bit of courage a little bit of bravery but um, I think you'll feel very proud of yourself after you do it and I think you might be pleasantly surprised with what it could mean for your friendship once you are honest about that. I'm so sorry this was a short episode, but I've got to get my ass to the airport uh, because I am not going to miss a flight on a holiday weekend. It's just not going to happen. So um, short episode may it have been, um, but I still had fun here nonetheless. And I hope you guys are taking a few days to yourself this weekend, hanging out with family, friends, chosen family, whatever it is. I hope that you are surrounded by people who make you feel good this weekend. Um, I know that this time of year can be challenging and to be completely honest with you, this year it's challenging for me too. So, um, we're doing our best and we're going to focus on the people and the relationships that make us feel good. And we're just going to take it one day at a time. So I love you guys. Hang in there, do something for you. Take care of yourself. Give your pets a smooch on the head for me and I'll see you in next week. Bye.